Good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, Whitney Mendel. Welcome to our virtual panel event, Appreciating Essential Workers in Healthcare. I am an assistant professor in public health here at Damon College, and I'm so pleased to be joined by a number of you on YouTube and all of our panelists. Um, thank you for joining us for this fifth installment of our ongoing series of the live virtual panel events to discuss current events, hot topics, and happenings. There's lots to discuss all the time these days. Uh, thanks, you, uh, thanks to our sponsor as well, the Graduate Program at Damon College for inspiring this event and these conversations. We have a number of wonderful panelists joining us today, and I'm going to uh, introduce them just by name, then have them introduce themselves with uh, their title so you have a better idea of who it is what we're learning with today. So Tiffany Goldwire, would you start, please? Hi, good afternoon. My name is Tiffany Goldwire, and I'm a research program coordinator for the Center for Nursing Research and Innovation at Mount Sinai Hospital. Thank you, Tiffany. Nicholas, would you mind introducing yourself, please? Sure, I'm Nick Ponitera. I'm a physical therapist at Erie County Medical Center in downtown Buffalo. Great, thank you. Carl, would you mind introducing yourself? Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Carl Shalahorn. I'm president and founder of Shalahorn Consulting and also a former adjunct uh, faculty member in the social work department at Damon College. Wonderful, thank you. Dylan. Oh. I'm Dylan, I'm a medical SLC therapy of Western New York and a emergency medical technician with Twin City Ambulance. Wonderful, thank you. And Eric. Hey everyone, my name is Eric Waltz. I'm a physician assistant with UBMD Emergency Medicine over at Millard Fillmore Suburban Hospital. Great, thank you everybody. So excited again to learn with all of you. We may have one more panelist joining us, we're hoping. We'll see how that goes. I uh, just wanted to give you a few heads up before we get started with questions, uh, just so you have an idea of what to expect. Um, in an effort to hear from each panelist, I'm going to field questions to each person so that it's not, um, right, no one gets left out. And everybody can take center stage for a moment. Um, and then, of course, the panelists are welcome to join into that conversation once that person has answered the question. The more conversation, the better, right? These, you all have, I'm sure, very interesting things to say and lots of overlap, so that would be great. And for our audience, please feel free to use the chat feature and that will be brought to us uh, by our wonderful kind of mastermind behind these things, Kate Hammer. So please feel free to chime in with comments, suggestions, uh, questions for us, and we'll do our best to answer those. We also want to just acknowledge the fact that um, we're aware of the privilege of being employed at this time, right? This is a conversation about being an essential uh, worker in healthcare, and although it's a stressful time, certainly want to acknowledge that um, it is still a privilege to be working during this time. Uh, certainly been very difficult for many of us since March and even before then a little bit, and we want to be mindful of the detrimental effects of COVID-19 on all aspects of our lives, including our work and employment, just kind of taking a note. I uh, also wanted to provide a bit, a bit of a definition of what uh, an essential worker in healthcare is. This is different phrasing than we might be used to. It's certainly been talked about quite broadly since March. Um, we certainly, uh, as Damon College, have a number of health professions uh, in, that we have in terms of programs here, including nursing, physician assistant, social work, physical therapy. Um, the list goes on and on, and we want to just uh, make mention that essential workers in healthcare really run the gamut from nurses physician assistant, physical therapist, doctors, social workers, therapists, researchers, right? The list goes on and on. There's an awful lot of a big team that goes into providing that essential care uh, during COVID and otherwise. So just wanted to make that known so that we're inclusive of those who are playing such critical roles. So we'll get started with our first question. We're gonna start with Eric. Um, in your position, each of you have had a bird's eye view um, of the impact of COVID-19 and the response of healthcare systems to the pandemic. What is one thing you wish everyone could see or understand from your perspective? Well, first, Whitney, I wanted to thank you and Kate and everyone at Damon for allowing us to be a part of this talk. I think the biggest thing would just be uh, if people realize kind of what we do on the day-to-day the -day aspect, especially in the emergency department. Uh, there was almost like a pre-PTSD feel when everything first started in COVID. So, we saw everybody down in New York City and what was going on down there. And we knew it was just kind of a, a matter of time before it came up here to Western New York. So every day going into work, we didn't really know if that was going to be the surge 
or if we were going to be able to buy a few more days, a few more weeks. And there was that constant, you know, anxiety that was overhanging us going into work every day. Uh, a lot of people were not able to see their families for several months on end. So your family was actually your work family mm-hmm. and everybody at work every day where there were actually quite a few days where I enjoyed going into work because I actually live alone. So that was kind of the only social interaction that I had was actually going into work and seeing people there. Uh, so yeah, people just kind of realize that we're human as well. You know, we've cried at work. We've, you know, shouted and been angry at work. We've been sad at work with family members next to the bedside of patients and just know that we've been in this together with the patients and everybody else in the community. You know, it's, it's a learning curve. We've actually had emails probably every five minutes at work, something's changing. Wow. So there's one policy and then three, four minutes later, it's changing to something else. Two days later, it's changing to something else there. So yeah, just, you know, realize that we're all human beings too. And we're kind of learning with the community and, you know, our end goal is to just provide the best care that we can and just hope that everybody gets out of this safely. Yeah, absolutely. There's, there's been so much focus on um, mental health of all of you in this right effort. Anybody want to add to this conversation a bit? Actually, so thank you, Whitney. I was just gonna just gonna touch on that topic. So uh, thanks again for having me uh, join you today. And of course, my area of focus is mental health. And Eric, you, when you talk about PTSD and the trauma that's going on now, and and actually the pre-trauma, like you described, I, I, I mean, even from the very beginning, I could not. I'm not me among many other mental health professionals could foresee this this trauma that we'd be going into. I could describe it almost like a tsunami of, of uh, mental health concerns that uh, people would be experiencing, you know, during and even after it's over because PTSD does last after the event or events. So certainly that's something that's, that's been on my radar for a long time. And of course, hearing from you, Eric, and others that work in the field directly, um, it will have an effect. And I think that's something that people need to know because our mental health is so important. And, and for those who are really dealing with this every day, it can really affect you uh, significantly. And that, of course, we'll talk more about that later. Wonderful, thank you. Yeah, there's so much to, that we're still in this, right? So there's still many things to keep considering. Tiffany, you said you wanted to add something as well. Um, yeah, so to piggyback off of what Eric said, I think especially in New York City, being in New York City myself, it snowballed so quickly um, I actually was able to, I've been able to work from home and people would think, oh, that's so great. Like you're working from home and it, it is, but I also live alone. So working from home and not seeing anyone for four or five months at a time and being able, not being able to interact with anyone was, you know, it, it definitely took a toll and also dealing with what I felt like was an increased amount of of work that I was doing because everything was so quick and we had to have responses to everything. And I think, um, you know, it's this idea that because you're home, you're always available. And then I, I would always catch myself checking my email and checking my, my phone, even during the hours that I wasn't working because everything was changing so quickly. I was afraid that I was going to miss something that I needed to do that was like crucial because everything was changing so quickly. Yeah, I feel like for a lot of folks, I, I have the privilege of working with an institute locally that supports frontline workers uh, around trauma and trauma-informed care. Um, so I've kind of been behind the scenes and witnessing some of the very things that you all have been talking about and the, the boundaries getting fairly blurry because this is not just professional that we're experiencing this. This is personal and professional. It gets a little trickier. Um, and Eric, thanks for highlighting that you all are human. Right, that this is this is not something you can just turn on and turn off when you need to, but that it's something that you carry with you into every aspect of what else you're doing. So thank you for that, Dylan. Um, you have each played very different roles during the response to COVID. How are you, and how have you been coping? Oh, it seems like there might be a little snag. Looks like maybe Wi-Fi troubles. Anybody else want to chime in with how they've been doing and how they're coping while we connect with Dylan? Well, I, I guess I'll jump in. Thanks, um, Carl. So, for one, one thing I've been doing, and I think it's it's 
uh, stuff that I think people are dealing with that might have difficulty if they are living alone, but using my social supports. And I do that sometimes. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I'm married, so I have my wife at home. But um, I, I reach out to my friends and I, I you know, either call or, or text. Um, so maintaining those social connections has been a really big part for me. Uh, I also meditate every day. I've, I've had a daily meditation practice even, you know, well before COVID. So that's other primary coping mechanism because it helps me to reduce, you know, anxiety and uh, just helps with my overall well-being. And then also exercise. I try to exercise when I can, get out, take a walk. So there's a lot of things I do in terms of self-care to help me during these times. And I think a lot of them are universal. People do these, but those are the things that I do. Yeah, thank you for sharing. Thank you, Sadhu. I'd like to chime in as well. Yeah, I guess I would just like to kind of uh, tag him off what Carl was saying there. Um, you know, you're kind of putting so much effort into work uh, to be there for your patients as they're going through these trying times as much as trying to be there for your family and friends. Um, so the idea of Zoom, which really didn't really exist kind of in my stratosphere prior to all this stuff, um, ability to connect, kind of keep your social circle going, um, to try to reach out as much as you can, to try to maintain a little bit of sanity as you kind of work through, you know, like Eric, Eric had mentioned, kind of changing policies, day-to-day -day changes that just kind of seem so drastic. Uh, you know, and thankfully with the weather, trying to get outside and just trying to get out of the hospital or the, the work setting for a little place tend to be a little therapeutic for me. Yeah. The degree of uncertainty seems to really be challenging people's coping strategies, right? Or you're having to double down or even create new ones for sure. Um, also, Tiffany, this question's for you. COVID has clearly thrown such a wrench in all plans that ever was and continues to with all these repeated policy changes kind of minute to minute. I'm wondering um, what ways your role has been altered because of COVID or the response to it. So, mm -hmm. uh, my role as a research program coordinator consists of me working with individual researchers, research study coordinators in the preparation, conduction, and data monitoring of nurse-led research studies. I also assist with center-related um, studies that are taking place. So because of COVID, all COVID, all non-COVID-related studies were suspended from March to September. Um, and because of that, I had to quickly adjust to taking on new tasks and new responsibilities that were assigned to me for example, seeking out and onboarding experienced nurse researchers who were quali specifically qualified to work on COVID-related studies. So typically the nurses that I work with are um, not familiar with research and they're like kind of just getting their feet wet. So my department is basically guiding them. We're giving them resources, we're guiding them. Um, and now I had the task of like, going through a whole list of 600, 700, 800 nurses and trying to find nurses that were experienced, that had these specific qualifications that were needed for COVID studies, um, you know, whether it was for the emergency department or whether it's for oncology, like all the different departments were doing different COVID related studies and each researcher needed to have specific qualifications. So I think I was just thrown into something that I, I wasn't used to doing, but just had to be flexible and kind of go with the flow. Yeah, that need to have ready feet, right? <laughs> to be able to move in any yeah. direction. Any other folks want to come in? I know, Nick, you said even Zoom wasn't something familiar to you in your line of work, and now it's probably part of a day-to-day -day process. Yeah, you know, for us, it's, um, you know, we're, we've been more hands-on. Um, you know, and I can certainly speak to, as Tiffany said, kind of the uh, changing and kind of transitioning of roles in the hospital. Um, you know, I know we'll kind of speak to that later, but kind of assessing what your role was prior and now with the virus, how it's shifting or what you can do to serve, um, you know, the public in a manner that really was not necessarily part of your original uh, kind of protocol or training. Yeah, expanding roles, even if you're not quite <laughs> feeling confident in expanding, right? Other folks notice things that you've really had to pivot and change that that's that you've been experiencing as a result of COVID. Well, for me, you know, once again, my my perspective is a little bit different than than others uh, in terms of the work I do. Uh, but but a lot of I, what I've done in, in time has been about education and training on behavioral health 
And, and for me, it's actually been not, obviously, I don't think as much of a leap because everything I was doing formally in person, I've been able to do online. In fact, if anything, um, it's expanded my reach in terms of the training I've been able to do and, and the programs I've been able to offer. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's provided opportunity to reach more people. And that's the great thing. I've participated in some programs uh, through the African-American Health Equity Task Force and others that have been able to reach audiences perhaps like, you know, couldn't have been done before. So, so the thing that's great is that I think from this kind of work that I do, uh, even going after COVID, uh, you know, hopefully we'll see this you know, come under control, even afterwards, I see the things that I do continuing in a virtual platform as well as in person. So that's been something that I found to be helpful for what I do. It's interesting to think about that. Certainly a lot of you have had to pivot and shift and expand uh, and probably contract in certain spaces. And also to think about so many opportunities, Carl, to your point, thinking about accessibility being so different potentially new opportunities of course um good bad or otherwise but just thinking about how we can truly make sure people have access to what they need um, in a way we didn't have to think about or at least didn't think about beforehand uh dylan i see you're back with us so happy to have you back um wanted to check in see how you're coping uh, and we're also talking about how our roles have changed because of covid hi yeah so sorry about that uh the internet that i was on just kicked me right out. So <laughs> I switched over to my phone. So hopefully we have better results here. But uh, um, honestly, when I signed up for this, and I was given this question, I have to actually take a second and think about how I was actually doing. Um, because I'm in both roles, I work as a uh, physical therapist during the day. And then usually, um, I work four or five weeknights and a weekend as an EMT. And I'm just go, 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 go all the time that you don't actually have time to sometimes think about like, is, am I, am I normal or am I just moving? So um, I took a second and I reflected and I, I'm okay. Um, I think that having my coworkers to uh, talk about stuff and rely on is super helpful. And like, once again, I'm so thankful to have both of my jobs um, to keep my household going. Um, and it's really especially in EMS, we're kind of like a, a little family. You get to spend 12 hours in an ambulance with one person. So um, you get to know people on a very big personal level. So it's really nice to have that to go and talk about um, everything. So they're kind of like your own little mental health therapist for the day. <laughs> yeah, the importance of connection seems to be a theme that keeps cropping up for everyone, right? Absolutely. Snuggling up with those you're with at <laughs> work, right? You're, you're with them often more times than you are with, with family, especially during these times when you might be limited to being able to be with folks. Uh, Carl, from your perspective, which is a bit unique, um, what do you see as the current pressing needs of essential workers in healthcare? As, as it's obvious, my, my area is mental health and behavioral health, but I would say there's so many needs in general. I think, first of all, and of course, we're saying acknowledging, um, you know, and appreciating our healthcare workers. That's first and foremost. Uh, I believe that that is necessary. That that the work that's being done here by pretty much everyone else here um, you know, on the on the webinar or on the meeting um, is really vital and crucial. And so, aside from that recognition, I, I think that um, our our healthcare workers need support. A mental emotional support because of as we said before the trauma the, the anxiety the depression that can come along with doing this kind of work in the, in the long term you know and of course we'll, we'll, we'll work through this now but there's still a ways to go so whether it be services through eap or through uh, you know counseling or support groups or, or things of that sort that can really give individuals uh, an opportunity to voice what they're feeling and maybe in a confidential manner, because sometimes people don't want to talk about these things in the workplace and they don't want to talk about them with their family. But giving a person to be able to have a platform or a venue to kind of share what they're going through with someone who can provide um, support, feedback and guidance is really crucial. And, and I think if, if people had access to that as well, it's important, too. So it might be a matter of, of um, access through insurance or or providers 
uh, you know, a lot of the local uh, behavioral health providers have uh, telehealth or other services, which makes it easier to engage. But but then again, I think if, if individuals work in these fields were aware of what's available, then they might be more likely to pursue them. And understand too, the last thing I'll say is that to seek help is not a sign of weakness. In fact, it's a sign of strength, a sign of, of wanting to, to deal and you know, manage what you're going through. So I encourage anyone who is struggling in any kind of way to, to reach out and get that kind of help. Yeah, I, I second all of that as a social worker. <laughs> Eric. Yeah, just to go off of what Carl said, uh, I think the biggest thing is just support. Uh, I, I remember back in, I think it was end of March, beginning of April, I was walking into the hospital for work and it was the, the smallest gesture, kids with their parents had written with chalk on the sidewalk. And it said, you know, best of luck, keep doing what you're doing. Thank you for your service. Stuff like that is just kind of the little push that you need to get up to the top of the mountain when you go through those days. Uh, text from family, friends, People I haven't heard back from, from, you know, undergrad seven, eight, nine years ago, but they're just saying, you know, thinking of you, best of luck with everything. Stuff like that is all we really need, you know, whether it's a letter in the mail, a quick text, or like I said, chalk on the sidewalk, you know, something as simple as that really was that push we needed to get through the day and just know that, you know, we're going to get through this together. Dylan, do you have something to add as well? Yeah. Like Eric said, any little thing is super helpful. Just, you know, a quick little text that's just like, hey, hope you're you're doing you're okay. Um, I know when it, it first initially was happening and I'd get off my 12-hour shift on the ambulance, you know, I need to stop home or to the grocery store before getting something. It really seemed like, you know, some people were fearful that, you know, somebody in the healthcare world was like in the grocery store. So mm -hmm. um, just, you know, those quick little gestures mean everything right now for sure. Thank you for that. Um, can you guys hear me? Yep. Oh, um, yeah, I, I, although I'm not, um, you know, in the, in the hospital every day, I do have friends and family members that are nurses. And um, I definitely think the little gestures make a really big deal. Um, I am a part of a sorority and what we did was we, sent lunches to a lot of essential workers. Um, they allowed us to choose some people that we knew that were essential. So I sent some of my friends just gift cards for them to pick up lunch or, you know, DoorDash gift cards so that they could order something when they're home. Because um, like Dylan said, it's going into the supermarket or going in after being exhausted all day. Sometimes you just don't even have the energy to do the basic things that you need to do. So having that extra help is always important. And I definitely think it, it didn't go unnoticed and it gave, it gave people that extra push that they needed. Yeah. It's such an interesting position for all of us to be in, right? We can't fix what's happening. So some of these small gestures, acknowledgement and encouraging folks to do what they need to take care of themselves is a big piece. We're going to take just a quick, quick break uh, for a Damon graduate studies commercial. We'll be right back. At Damon College, we strive to help every student reach their educational and professional goals. With exceptional resources and one-of-a-kind learning experiences, our graduate and professional programs will put you on the right path to career success. Our graduate programs include applied behavior analysis, education, nursing, social work, and more. Seven of our 11 graduate programs are open to any undergraduate major. Explore our graduate programs today by visiting damon.edu slash graduate. Welcome back. Um, I have a question for Nick this time. So oftentimes folks in healthcare speak of being called to work that they do not just as a job, but kind of as a purpose. It's, it's a bit of who they are as opposed to what they do, a devotion to service really. How at all do you feel that COVID may have challenged or bolstered that sense of purpose for you? Yeah, you know, I think honestly, it probably did both. Uh, during the process, you know, I probably want to hit the challenge part first. Um, you know, if you're in the medical field uh, or connected to it, you usually have that call to service, right? You want to serve, you want to help others. Um, that's really part of why you got into it. Um, but then you get this new virus and you have this kind of what now moment, you know, what am I supposed to do? How do I attack this properly? What can I do to help? Um, and echoing before, 
a lot of the unknowns, um, the changing guidelines, what kind of equipment should we wear? What kind of equipment shouldn't we wear? Do we have enough equipment? All this stuff kind of weighed in. Um, you know, you want to be beneficial to the patients. You want to be beneficial to your coworkers. Um, you know, and at the same time, you're not sure necessarily how to do it. Um, what kind of training is enough to kind of get you through it? Um, speaking personally, I had a newborn uh, that's now almost eight months. So I came back really in the midst of when it was starting to ramp up here locally. Um, and then knowing, you know, am I going to bring it home? Um, is my job going to put my family? Is the job going to put my daughter in danger? Um, you know, it's a little nerve wracking. So that certainly challenged um, kind of that devotion to it. At the same time, it really bolstered um, kind of why I got into the profession. I assume it's probably why uh, it did the same to a lot of other people. You know, you found kind of the purpose. How are you going to help these patients progress? Um, you know, from, like I said, not really knowing how to attack, to, you know, even proning a patient, getting a person, you know, laying on their stomach. Um, that's really innovated, trying to get them to breathe better, providing range of motion, trying to keep them moving as they're innovated. Um, and when you finally see a little bit of progress with some of your patients, um, that was really kind of a great moment to kind of know that what you're doing is actually working. So finally seeing that positive was really um, kind of a key role. So you were able to kind of take pride uh, that you were part of the process and that you kind of found a way to um, be a beneficial portion, you know, of that patient's care. It sounds like quite a mix, right? The, because it is something that you might take on all this worry and fear and, and question marks. And yet it sounds like it also has been affirming of why you're doing what you do. Absolutely. Others want to weigh in on that as well. And this kind of being a devotion to service, this calling that you've had, or those you've worked with and how COVID may have affected that. Sure, I'll chime in. Um, on the EMS aspect, it really took a toll for us where, you know, we're most of the time, um, People are scared now to go to the hospital and they seek our advice and they're like, should we go? Should we not go? Or they wait until, you know, it's really bad for them to, you know, get in and get help. And we're first on scene and trying to address all those acute problems. Um, just, you know, letting people know that it's okay to seek help and that sometimes the hospital is your best choice. Sometimes it's not. It's just really given us a sense of purpose as to being that first advocate for that patient right then and there about deciding what is the next best step for them and is there a next best step and do we really know and um, we kind of just went from you know to taking care of the problem to like actually taking care of the scenario altogether now um, is it better for them to stay home with their caretaker versus um you know, bringing them in. And we really had to seek guidance for our higher ups too, by contacting medical control and saying, this is what's happening. This is what's going on. They don't want to go in and we're trying to convince them. And, you know, do you have advice? And it's really hard seeing somebody that should probably get help. And they just decide to stay home because they're just so afraid of COVID and everything. So. Yeah so many moving pieces and, and having to help people sort out even what to do in terms of engaging with care when before this, it likely was less of a question, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we have another panelist who's able to join us, um, Elimana Imamovic. She is a phlebotomy technician at Clyde Health and a former student of mine in the MPH program. Elimana, so good to see you. Um, would you mind if I, hi, would you mind if I start with a question here? Not at all, go right ahead. So I've heard this time and time again, I think it's true uh, in the media as well, essential workers in healthcare referred to as heroes. And although the intention is to acknowledge the courage of these individuals, uh, some argue that it's potentially dangerous painting workers as superhuman and potentially denying them space to let down their guard, to not be the rock or have emotions in general. What are your thoughts on labeling essential workers in healthcare heroes? Um, it's a really relevant question. Um, I think even before COVID, we always think about doctors and nurses as being heroes, but now it's not just healthcare workers. There's a lot of essential workers out there who are also heroes. Um, having to work when you think about people like grocery store workers who are working as essential workers when they don't actually 
have potentially the education or the resources to know what they're fighting against. It's different for those of us who have taken science classes, who are working in healthcare, who know the proper way to use PPE, the proper way to do this or that. But I digress as usual. Mm -hmm. um, it's important. We do need to be appreciated for what we do, but people also have to remember that we're human and that we need, um, we're gonna, with something as new and novel as this virus that sometimes we're not always gonna make the best decision or we might not have most appropriate information that other diseases, we've been studying them for 20, 30, 40 years. We have answers. This one, we don't. Um, being in this kind of work, we're used to kind of subverting ourselves for our patients. It's a giving type of work, no matter what end of healthcare you're in. I personally don't feel like I'm as much of a hero as, um, as a doctor in a COVID wing, but at the same time, I also know that I'm exposed and I know that I still need to be trying to educate my patients because a lot of them come in and talk to me more than they might talk to their doctor. Um, it's important. We, we need to remember that the healthcare workers are really putting themselves on the line, no matter what aspect of healthcare they're doing. But we do have to remember that they are human. They do need a break. If you're going through COVID fatigue, we are going through more COVID fatigue because we have to deal through all the patients all the time and all the same questions over and over again. Um, and you just have to remember that this is what you signed up for. This is part of what being in healthcare or public health is. It's dealing with these kind of situations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Other folks have thoughts on this label of hero. I see some questions coming in too from the audience. I'll get to those in just a second. I wanted to chime if, if I could, Whitney. Sure. So my thoughts on that too, I, I agree with everything everyone said so far. I, I think it's something we signed up for. You know, we're not necessarily heroes. Like Nick said, we just had that calling. You know, we all want that higher purpose and helping people out. So that's why we got into it. I think the the other heroes are actually the the people on the front lines in those grocery stores, the gas stations, et cetera, where they didn't sign up for that. You know, they they signed up to work in a grocery store and they might not have the PPE that we have available. And that is probably nothing that they did sign up for, yet they still go to work every day. They usually have a smile on their face and they're there to help people. Uh, I, I've always thought I think the hospital is one of the safest places right now, to be honest with you. Uh, we do have the policies in place and we do have the PPE where if you go to a store or a bar or a restaurant, it might not be as safe or, you know, healthy at, at that point. So I think those are the, the people that are really doing the good work right now is the ones that didn't necessarily sign up for this. And they might not have the PPE or protection that we do, yet they still go to work every day and get the job done. Mm. I appreciate all of your awareness of all the other folks who are essential workers, right? Not just in healthcare and, and Eric, as you said, and Elimana, you as well, that folks didn't necessarily sign up for this, this role, especially in COVID. Any other thoughts on the, on the hero label? Does it feel like it sits well? Does it feel like it, it keeps you from being able to not be so superhuman? I'd like to add on to what I said before in regards to that. Um, I think that if you are in some sort of healthcare work, you kind of have a little bit of that in you. You kind of want to be um, maybe not the doctor at the forefront of the surgery, but you want to help people. You want to have some role in being a little bit of a kind of superhero, um, maybe not necessarily using that kind of word, but to know that you have helped someone in their healthcare journey. Um, so I think that, yeah, maybe you didn't want to be a nurse in a COVID wing, but you thought you were at least going to just be a nurse who was helping people in, let's say the ICU after their surgery, you thought you're at least doing that and helping them. So I think that we all kind of want it, but maybe we don't want it at the level that we've now been <laughs> shouldered with having to take it on. Does that make sense? What I'm trying Abs to say? Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. I think we all kind of have a little bit of it in us, but maybe we didn't think we were going to have to do it to this extent. Absolutely. 
Thank you so much, Elimana, for that. We have a question from our own uh, Dr. Ford. With COVID numbers on the rise, what coping mechanisms have you developed or adopted that have been most effective if and when move into another wave of COVID? And Dylan, do you want to take the lead on this question? Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ford, for your question. Um, coping mechanisms are huge um, in general uh, as a healthcare worker even without COVID and COVID has really ramped that up. Um, I know for myself as I said, an EMT, I'm also a traveling therapist. I go into um, children's homes and daycares and stuff. And it's really anxiety inducing to not know what situation you're gonna walk into um, if that person is gonna be experiencing COVID or if it's gonna be safe and um, I know my anxiety has doubled, maybe tripled since COVID started, which, you know, I'm sure everyone's has. And I think it's really important to find yourself um, a mental health therapist if need be. Um, that's what they're for. That's their job. That's their part as an essential worker in this too. Um, and to make sure that you're also communicating with people in the same scenario as you I know when we have really bad calls for EMS, we do a debriefing after with everybody involved. If that means police, fire, um, EMS, whoever it may be, even the hospital staff that we bring it to. Um, and it's really beneficial for all of us to be like, you know, that was really hard. It's okay. Um, if you need to talk, we're here. And just making sure that you are like surrounding yourself with supportive people that can actually relate to what you're going through. Um, just to add to what Dylan was saying, I think I realized during this time how important it is to just sometimes take a step back and not feel like you need to do a lot of things or, you know, sometimes people will reach out and you just don't have it in you to to speak or, you know, to to talk. And I realized that a lot because in the beginning, a lot of people wanted to call and they wanted to talk, but all they wanted to talk about was COVID and it was exhausting and it was anxiety provoking. And, you know, some days it was just too much for me. So especially being in New York with the numbers going back up and, you know, we just got noticed that, you know, everything's going to be closing at 10 o'clock and for New York City, something closing at 10 o'clock is a big deal. <laughs> it's a big deal. Um, and you know, the holidays coming and just seasonal depression and all of these things on top of COVID, I think um, it's important to take time for yourself, whatever that looks like, you know, if someone is calling you and you feel like, oh my God, I have to answer this person because they might need me, but you're not in a good mental space or you feel a little bit bogged down, it's okay to take that time to get yourself in a better mental place and revisit with that person later. Cause I think that as healthcare workers in general, like um, Helena said, we are naturally giving people and we want to help and we want to give back. And I think that spills over into every aspect of our lives. But um, I think it's very important to make sure that we take care of ourselves first, because you can't really do anything for anyone if you aren't, taking care of yourself. And I just wanna just touch base, just a small step on just um, kind of like the occupational part of it. Just hopefully this time around, um, we know a little bit more. I guess mentally that helps going into work that uh, we're not going into this for the first time. Um, you know, hopefully we have a better idea of how to treat, uh, how to better remediate these patients, kind of a confidence boost for us uh, I think as healthcare workers that maybe we're going to be better this time around with some more knowledge. Um, and then kind of uh, also echoing Dylan, uh, kind of debriefings, you know, I think our senior therapists and uh, other management kind of talking to us more, um, just decreasing the amount of unknowns seem to really help uh, within the hospital, at least for us. And if I, if I could just uh, also add too, on a more, um, I guess, universal note, it's great just to find an escape. So, uh, you know, find that show on Netflix or Hulu or, uh, you know, network or sports. I mean, the bills are on a roll, watch bills game. <laughs> um, do something for yourself that 
it gives you time for yourself. Now, obviously, uh, you know, Nick, I heard you just say you have a uh, you know, young child, infant uh, at home, so it may be a little more challenging uh, for parents sometimes, but still try to carve up some time for you. And that's really important as far as your own self-care because we need to re-energize. We need to get restoration and, and also sleep. So I think sleep's underrated. And of course, I'm talking to a bunch of folks here who many times, especially I think of Eric and, and, and Nick and these, all of you who are, who are in position, and even Dylan, I mean, you're in these jobs that are so demanding that sometimes sleep is, I won't say it's an afterthought, but it's something that you have to be intentional and make sure you get proper rest because getting proper rest is going to be the way to help you do your job better. And also it just gives you that, that ability to, to kind of recoup and get kind of get back to where you want to be. But, but like I said, I can't stress enough, just find time just to have those healthy diversions. I mean, um, that's one of my favorite things you can do is just watch a show. I'm, I'm actually getting into Black Mirror on Netflix. I don't know if anybody's ever seen that. It's really kind of a, kind of a future, just, you know, kind of show that it's just kind of out there, but I like it. It's fun. It's a great escape. So that's my suggestion. So many options in terms of coping. And I think about this again, from my perspective as a social worker, public health professional, and in, in supporting frontline workers of all variations, that there's a heightened risk during COVID in particular for things like burnout or compassion fatigue or bigger conversation about vicarious trauma, right? You're actually sponging up someone else's traumatic experiences because you're witnessing it. You're walking alongside of them and that. So Dylan, I know that the question we were gonna ask you is right in line with what we've been talking about, but is there anything you've noticed, not just about yourself, but in the colleagues, and because you're in two different spaces that you've been noticing about the workers around you that around mental health? Yeah, um, I actually sought out um, people's advice on this once I knew this was going to be a question of mine. Um, and it was really interesting to see the two different professions and the responses. And for PT, um, right now, I'm like I said, I'm working with kids um, from zero to five. So, you know, trying to explain to them how wearing a mask is important and like why I have to keep mine on and you know why their parents have to have theirs on and even though I'm in their home like it's even though it's a safe space like I still have to be protective and stuff so all of those therapists are trying to really figure out how to go about wording this and it's it's kind of nerve-wracking for them and with what Tiffany said is that you know the rules are changing the guidelines are changing for us and for me, I work in both Erie and Wyoming County, where the two rules are different um, for EI, which is early intervention, and preschool. Um, so each level has its own rules and regulations, and I have to keep remembering, like, okay, what do I have to be doing here? What do I have to be doing there? Um, taking our temperature every morning, monitoring ourselves, you know, doing more paperwork about COVID and everything, and it just, it's a lot of burnout, like you had said, and, you know, it's just getting started, unfortunately. Um, so, but, you know, now that we do know what's going on, we can get ourselves into a little bit of a rhythm. Um, and as far as the EMS side, um, I think that has gotten a little worse. Um, a lot of people, you know, are very fearful of not having enough PPE or walking into a situation where you don't think you need it. And then it turns out that you probably should have had it on. And are you going to get it now? Are you going to take it home in 12 hours from now? Um, I know a lot of my coworkers and including myself have had COVID. Um, luckily, none of us have had any severe um, issues or symptoms with it. So that's good. Um, but, you know, still thinking and being fearful about, is there a chance we could get it again? Um, is there a different strain? And it's just, it's very heavy every day to go in. And um, I know that when, you know, people are sick now, that's a whole 12 hour shift we have to fill. So people are now getting mandated to come into work extra. Mm -hmm. And that's really taking a big toll on a lot of the paramedics, um, not being able to spend the time off that they do have with their family, now having to work an extra shift a week or every other week. Um, 12 hours is a long time um, and it's, it's, it's becoming a lot. And I, I see burnout on both ends and, you know, just those big kind words of, you know, 
keep going or you got this or you're amazing or really helpful in these situations, like we said before. Yeah, Carl, to, to your point earlier, that acknowledgement of where people really are, this the idea of burnout is something especially, or as Elimana said, kind of COVID fatigue. We get lots of, I, I think it's a collective, a communal fatigue that a lot of us are experiencing, regardless of our positions for work. Um, I know we've touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to see if you had any other thoughts about how we can support workers in healthcare in light of the logistical and emotional challenges that we've been hearing about. And the fact that we are unfortunately seeing this uptick and potentially this other wave. You know, it's interesting that um, the idea of, of caregiving and, and, and helping um, our, our healthcare workers who are oftentimes caring, having multiple roles mm -hmm. as far as, you know, what they do uh, in their job, but also what they do at home, or they may be a caregiver for a family member, an older family member. Uh, these are these are challenges that are, are being faced by so many people. And even before COVID, it was challenging, right? But now we have uh, folks that are, you know, challenged with uh, might be working different shifts and they might have children at home with remote school or they might have a family member, say, in a skilled nursing or another type of facility. So I think one way that we can address this is to, once again, like I kind of alluded to this before, but provide resources uh, for folks just to have a way to um, cope with what's going on. Uh, not to say that you're going to be able to remove and, and, and change things in terms of the situation, but learn, like I said, those coping skills to be able to uh, with, withstand the stress involved. Uh, and I, I, I can speak from experience, not during COVID, but I can speak during, from experience of that taking care of an older uh, parent who was uh, very sick. So um, I know the stress and strain that's involved with that. Uh, so I think overall, we want to be able to provide things like, I mentioned, like EAP, uh, also, as I said before, seeking help professionally, uh, but also maybe even enlisting, if at all possible, the help of other family members or friends in a safe way, if it's at all safe to do that, especially if, if you have children uh, that might be able to have someone watch them or, or uh, be with them if you need to just take a break, uh, things of that sort. But I mean, and I would love to hear from, from others here who might have kids that, that you know, some of the things that they do for strategies they try to take on. Anybody else wanna share, or even what your places of employment have been doing to help support you during this time, emotionally and logistically with parenting and or mental health pieces? I can comment at least on the work aspect of that. Um, I'm not dealing with a, a school age child quite yet, thankfully. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, work has been very uh, flexible with being able to change uh, some of our therapists and coworkers' hours to work around them for childcare. Um, you know, people that were maybe working a classic Monday through Friday uh, are working maybe a weekend day or two, uh, maybe shifting away from an earlier start to a later start in the day to help with uh, childcare or to kind of get them on the bus if they're. Uh, not totally remote. Um, so I think work has recognized uh, that there's obviously a lot of moving parts uh, throughout this situation. Uh, and it's kind of refreshing to see that they've uh, been able to assist a lot of uh, our coworkers. That's wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually, that was one thing I, I slipped my mind, but I was going to actually mention that too, flexibility that uh, workplaces offer uh, is going to be, it's really huge. Uh, if anything, it also helps with, with engagement. It helps with morale. It helps with people feeling that their their workplace is supportive and is willing to help and, and be there for them when they need it um, because obviously if you are strained at home it's going to affect you at work there's a condition called presenteeism and presenteeism is when you are at work but you're thinking about something outside of work that's impacting your ability to do your work so if you are at work and you're you know preoccupied about a family member that you might be caring for or a child you won't be able to do your job properly. Whereas if you have flexibility to your schedule that might be able to address those concerns, then you'll be you know, a little bit better off, hopefully, and be able to do what you need to do. There's a question that just came in. Can you give advice to non-healthcare listeners about how to make workplaces safer? Are there suggestions for folks to help make the work environment feel safer, emotionally safe, I think, is really what the question's about. Well, um, thanks, Carl. <laughs> um, I'm just so so. Basically, I, I think you know um, 
for those not in healthcare, uh, and really what it amounts to is, is just providing that environment of, of safety. Uh, of course, that idea of, of security, knowing that when you go into work, it's going to be uh, clean. It's going to be uh, a place where you don't have to have be preoccupied uh, of, of this idea. Of, well, you know, will I contract a disease here? Uh, now, mind you, that's on the the employer, the workplace to make sure that's being done. Uh, but then again, hopefully, you know, those things are put into place. So, but we need to hear that from the employers. We need to hear that from the places of work to say we are doing these things to keep you safe, to make sure that you can come to work and be in a, a good environment, a healthy environment, one in which you can you know, not be concerned or preoccupied with uh, the idea of, you know, will I become ill? Uh, you know, I'm thinking like, for instance, like Wegmans, of course, you know, many people shop at Wegmans, large store, uh, they do a lot of things to keep people safe. And, and frankly, um, for a business like that, um, it's, it's remarkable that they do all they do. I mean, you see people all the time when I go there, it's the people, you know, wiping down, you know, uh, you know, display cases and, and, you know, cleaning floors. I mean, they are on top of it. And I suppose I think that's the, that's the duty and obligation of our workplaces to make sure that the workers feel uh, comfortable going in. And I often think about this in a, from a trauma informed perspective that a lot of your roles, each one of you in a different way is trying to create a safe space for your patients, for your clients, for whomever you're working with. And it's hard to offer safety if you don't feel safe. Um, and yes, healthcare is really good at thinking about physical safety. It's a lot harder to consider, I think, because it's a bit of a moving target, emotional safety, what makes people feel safe. Dylan, to your point earlier of helping people to feel safe in making decisions about their care because they're so fearful of even going to the hospital to get the care they need. Eric, do you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, so we actually just had a question come in. Uh, someone was saying so many people don't seem that this is real. What can I say to make them feel that this is real? It's so frustrating. Uh, I guess the only thing I can add for that is, and I'm sure other people can speak to it, including Dylan and Nick, uh, this is very real. Uh, I, I don't think I've ever seen this many sick people in this high acuity in my short career in the emergency room. Uh, there was one case vividly that stands out. That was a 35-year-old that came in and was completely fine, just had some symptoms upon entering the ER, and then within two hours was intubated on a ventilator in the ICU, tested positive for COVID. So when you see that you know, firsthand in person, you know that this is very, very real. So I, I don't mean to scare people. I don't mean to freak people out, but just know that this virus is very real, and the reason that it was you know, decreasing in numbers for as long as it was, was because things were working and we were finally trying to figure things out. So th this is definitely very real. That's the only, you know, piece of information I can give there is I've seen firsthand how detrimental this can be and how very real this virus is. Something we wish people would see firsthand enough to, to know what to do and to take it seriously. Ellie Mana. Yeah, I'm just kind of piggybacking off of what he was saying um, and maybe this isn't really like the best example. And I just had three things that I wanted to talk about, but I'm going to try not to go too off topic. Um, it is very real. And I think that our media has been explaining how real it is and not showing how real it is. And, you know, obviously you can't violate HIPAA. You can't go and show people's faces and things, but just the other night on TV, um, they had a couple of those medical drama type shows that are supposed to be more current and they did, um, COVID episodes where, you know, they're showing nurses with people coming in who now have to get put on ventilators. And even though it's just a TV show, it's very real. Cause it's very current. It's very relevant to what's going on right now. And it got my anxiety up just watching it, even though I am in a field where, I know that this is happening. And I was thinking to myself, people should be watching this and realizing what doctors and nurses are going through when they have to intubate a colleague of their own or a family member of their own that they don't even know if they're going to make it. And how many people are gonna watch this and think, oh, they're exaggerating for TV. I remember that was a really big issue um, for me watching that. It was hard for me to, to watch, even though it's not a show I really watch, but that episode just kind of sucked me in because mm -hmm. I know it gives some inkling of what 
the people that are really working in COVID hospitals and COVID wings are going through. Um, just touching back, it does give a lot of mental strain because even with your patients, you get connected to them. Even if it's a patient you only see once a week or once a month, if it's someone you see, or if it's just your patient, because of that giving aspect that we have, we tie ourselves into them. Um, and just touching back on what some employees are doing or employers are doing. So I work for Kaleida. Um, Kaleida in general has an employee assistance program service where you can, um, they've always had that, where you can go for mental health help or other assistance. But because of COVID, they specifically opened um, that. You were limited to how many times you could go based on what your situation was. They now opened up like a 24 hour, they call it a warm line, which is kind of like someone available to talk to you at any time. So it might not be that, and I don't know what they're doing for as far as childcare, because I don't have children, but it's kind of nice to know that if you are in the middle of a breakdown or you just can't take it anymore, it's very overwhelming sometimes doing the work that you're doing, especially when you're right in the throes of peak COVID, that when you have a break, you can call and just vent to someone and that they can help. Yeah. Um, and I think sometimes people don't understand even what we go through, even if we're not working in a COVID wing. Right. Yeah. You're still, it, just... it can be very overwhelming and exhausting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're trying to keep, all... keep everything clean. <laughs> <laughs> right. Even... Trying to keep right. everything clean. <laughs> <laughs> Tiffany, you wanted to add as well? Um, yes. Yeah. So I, I mean, it definitely is real. I think that, um, you know, I, I always knew that it was real, even though I wasn't going into the hospital every day, I wasn't going into the hospital for a good chunk of time, honestly. And when I finally did have to go back for once a week, um, you know, my primary role of transportation is public transportation in New York City. And that is the case for most people. And having to get back on that train was so anxiety provoking. Um, and, and just to see everyone on the train with mask on, and it was just like, wow, this is this is really happening. Like, this is, you know, this is something that's real. And um, I think in terms of trying to get people to see that it's real, I think that sometimes just in general, people don't see or feel or understand things unless they are affected by it personally. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that in a lot of ways, there's really nothing that we can do about that to get people to understand that it's real, get people to understand the importance of wearing masks and social distance. You know, people are going to believe what they believe and do things the way that they want to do them. I think the most important thing is to make sure that you're safe, to make sure that you're taking the precautions that are necessary to keep you and your family safe and just hope that others will at some point follow suit. Um, you know, you, you, you hope that it doesn't take something negative happening to them or, you know, for them to get COVID or for someone in their family to get COVID, for them to believe that it's real and for them to see that it's real. But I do think even in my own, even outside of work in my own personal experiences that that has been the case where it's like, oh, you know, people are living their lives and going on like nothing is happening. And then it, you know, a family member gets it or they get it. And then they're like, oh, wait, you know, this is a serious, a serious issue. Yeah. And I'm sure given what we've talked about with the mental health and, and the, the weight of all that you're carrying, that can feel like quite an affront if people aren't taking it seriously and, and you all are doing all you can. Dylan, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, um, this is very real. Um, I can tell you firsthand, um, the emergency medical side that um, definitely real. It does exist. People of all ages are getting affected um, in all different ways. Like I said, I know myself and my coworkers have even had some symptoms, um, luckily mild. But for those that are still doubting, even if it turns out not to be real or you don't think that it is real, um, there's no harm in wearing a mask. There's no harm in washing your hands extra. There's no harm in cleaning your surfaces more. In fact, you're just preventing other diseases that we do know more about and have studied for decades. And it's just making everything a much safer and healthier place for everybody in general. So um, just 
please do your due diligence and wear your mask, keep your distance and keep clean. Um, I wanna say thank you to everybody for allowing me to participate on this panel, but uh, work does call and I do have a kid to see at 1.30. So I'm gonna sign off. Um, if anybody wants to ask me about anything PT or EMS related, feel free to reach me um, on social media or via my Damon email. And it's exactly spelled in the way it is in the little corner here. And uh, good luck to everybody. Stay safe and stay, stay sane. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Thanks, Dylan. So much glad you could be with us. My pleasure. Bye, guys. So Nick, I'm curious, we have, I, we have a number of people who are watching all of this and some of them might be new to the profession or a version of healthcare professions. What advice would you give to those looking into healthcare knowing now what the past year has been like? Honestly, I'd say if, if you're still, if you're interested in the field at all, then go for it. Um, you know, regardless of what aspect within the health field, um, don't let this sway you otherwise. Um, it really is a rewarding profession as a whole regardless of some of the negativity and challenges that come along the way. Um, you know, like we talked about before, you kind of, you say, well, you, you kind of know what you signed up for, you know, but not a lot of people are talking about a, you know, once a century pandemic situation when they're making those quotes. Uh, so that obviously uh, makes things a little more interesting. Um, you know, there's always unknowns, but your purpose is kind of clear during this. So I think don't be turned away by, um, all the negative kind of aspects you see of it, you know, cause I think there's very real roles uh, for everybody, you know, within this field, um, within the health field, I should say as a whole, you know, I think just being out there uh, has given me a better appreciation for other faculties, other disciplines uh, that you work with. You know, I would kind of preach collaboration has been a massive uh, benefit for us, you know, between uh, uh, nurses, social work on the floor, uh, PAs, OTs, um, you know, the panel, you know, the variety of different, people you work with on a daily basis. So um, I would say, you know, if you're interested, by all means, continue the way forward. Wonderful. Maybe I'll have advice for folks who are considering a career or are new to a profession in healthcare. I think I could say something about that. Um, I feel like if you are serious about healthcare, the idea of this pandemic will not have really swayed you too much. Hmm. I feel like if, if it was something you wanted to do, you would still want to do it. Maybe you would not want to be an ER doctor, but maybe you would realize that, you know what, maybe I want to be in cardiothoracic. Maybe I'd rather just be a GP, but you'll know that you still want to help people in some way. Mm -hmm. um, and if, if something like this is making you doubt that, then maybe you have to think about that. Why is it you know, or do you need a different, a different aspect in healthcare? Maybe you don't need to be a doctor. Maybe you want to get an MPH instead and not actually deal with patients. <laughs> not that wasn't my, that wasn't my route. My route ended up working out a different way. And that's why I have the MPH. But originally I wanted to be a PA. That was the route I thought I was going to go with. And life circumstances, things changed. I'm not going to go into it. Um, but I still know that I still want to help patients. I know that my end of MPH, I want to be helping people more that are in hospitals or in doctor's offices. I want to be involved with patients. And I think that if, if something like a little old pandemic is going <laughs> to make you think twice, then maybe, maybe you don't, maybe, maybe you're only going to healthcare because you think you're going to make a lot of money. Or, you know, you want to be in, in an end of health care that isn't as involved with patients or something. Um, I right. think that something like this should be like a deciding factor for you mm -hmm. as to do you really want to be helping people in this aspect? You might still right. find another way to help people that is fulfilling. Right. Yeah. To tune into where, what you're, what's guiding you. Tiffany, do you want to mm -hmm. add? Thanks, Elimana. Um, yeah. Just to, just to piggyback off. Um, I definitely went into Damon College saying, I'm going to be a physician. I just knew that's what I was going to do. Didn't work out that way. Changed my mind. Um, but I will say, and I think this is, I think this kind of brings up the next question as well, but like 
my professors and my advisor, Justine Tatusco, who is amazing, um, definitely showed me that there were so many different areas of healthcare that I didn't need to be a clinician in order to have an impact. You know, you can impact people directly by giving them care. You can impact people indirectly by, you know, just organizing and being being the behind the scenes person. And I think that if someone is looking to get into healthcare, it's important to take uh, a look at where they fit, you know, and not only because of the pandemic, but, you know, if the pandemic is discouraging you, think about other ways and other areas that you can help that won't put you, you know, in the thick of this if it was to happen again. You know, you may be able to help, you may be able to be, you may be able to do research, you may be able to do policy, you may be able to, you know, get an MPH. There are so many different areas in healthcare where you're still giving back, where you're still, um, impacting people's lives and impacting their health, you know, in in any small way that makes a difference. So it's definitely important if this is what you want to do. I wouldn't let the pandemic discourage discourage you, but I definitely would just just take a step back and weigh all of your options. Mm-hmm. I have some students who are just saying, I wish I already had my MPH so I could be in the middle of the response to this. <laughs> it's a mixed bag. Carl, do you have something you wanted to offer as well? Yeah, just briefly. So from my perspective with behavioral health, it can be a very demanding field. And I will say this though, too, it can be very fulfilling. And certainly with COVID, I think we've kind of said this throughout the program today that mental health concerns have risen greatly in time over this last uh, several months. But one thing I would say in terms of advice I would give for someone who's interested in pursuing a behavioral health career is to be a sponge. Learn as much as you can, read as much as you can, uh, try to get a placement if you're in school that is uh, going to help you pursue uh, your goals. And and simply just, and even like, I remember a long time ago, I was told, you know, interview people that are doing that work to find out more about what it's like. So it, sometimes even getting that that real perspective, and I would say this for anybody, in any kind of healthcare, ask those questions of people that are doing the work, because that's sometimes where you're going to get the best answers on, and you know, what is it really like, aside from just learning the classroom. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. So a number of you, vast majority of you on this call are Damon alum, which makes us all incredibly proud. So thank you for that, just being who you are and what you're doing. Um, Elimana, I'm going to start with you. How has your education prepared you for this moment? And I know I'm a former professor, so you don't have to, (laughs) an unbiased (laughs) response is fair. Um, Well, you know, even before, um, I actually really like this question, even before having my MPH, because I thought that I was going to be a PA, that I was going to go to PA school, um, my undergrad courses really helped me a lot with my current job. Um, Not my final career destination, but what I'm doing now as far as drawing blood. And that part of my education has helped a lot because there's so much of basic um, anatomy and physiology and chemistry that I've been able to that, like I said, a lot of patients talk to me more than they talk to their doctor, or maybe I'm just an easy person to talk to. And they're like, so what's that for? What do we do with that? And I'm able to give them just from that end of things. I'm, and I I don't like the way this sounds, but I have a little bit more of an education than a lot of regular phlebotomy technicians do. So I'm able to give them some very good answers as to really why we do something a certain way. And then to get my MPH on top of it, and to be able to now be dealing with these patients that are coming in during a pandemic who are now asking me questions that a, a regular phlebotomy technician might not have answers to or not have um, a background for an answer as to where that answer comes from, to be able to explain to them the difference between a COVID test and a COVID antibody test or um, why they should not be wearing gloves all day long and touching everything before they come in to my outpatient lab and why I'm scolding them and making them take them off. Little things like that are, I find that I'm answering not so much now, but months ago and now it's gonna be starting again. Uh, Because I have that background, I'm able to say, look, this, 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 because of that, that, that. 
because of this. And, and sometimes, a lot of times, I get people saying, oh, I never thought about it that way. Oh, is that where it comes from? Oh, is this, you know, mm -hmm. um, most recently, everybody, I had a bunch of people saying, oh, because you come into my lab and there's Bill's stuff all over the walls. And, you know, so we start talking about the games and, oh, well, why can't we go? If, if they only let in, you know, 10,000 people, it wouldn't be that bad. Well, did you take into consideration this factor, this factor, this factor, this factor? Oh, I didn't think about it that way. Yeah. What if there's an emergency? How are you going to get 10,000 people out all at once without them all congregating in one area? Right. Right. I didn't think about that. Like yeah. little aspects of that that have to do with public health where, you know, I, I do hear some of the other technicians talking with some of the other patients and they all just kind of commiserate with them instead of trying to educate them further as to like, you shouldn't be commiserating with your patient. Oh yeah, I don't like wearing a mask either. Oh, I don't know when this is going to be over with. No, you have to be a rock in that instance and say, nope, this is the way it is. I'd rather have my mask on than have COVID. It's a real thing, even if you don't think it is. And mm -hmm. This is what we have to do. Um, yeah, it sounds I like your combination, that, yeah, a combination of your experience yeah. in the game and have really been helpful. I have no doubt. And yes. I also know you're a very easy person to talk to. So I'm guessing people <laughs> open up you. conversation with you in ways that they might not otherwise. Other folks, yeah. how do you feel like your education has helped you be prepared for, for this moment? So I don't, I, I don't think necessarily education, uh, Unfortunately, Damon was great school. I, I loved my time there, but I don't think anyone can really be prepared for a pandemic of this magnitude. So not necessarily the education part, but I think what was phenomenal was not only my professors at Damon, but then my preceptors on rotations that are now lifelong friends outside of school. Mm -hmm. So I think if that was the one thing Damon was able to provide during this pandemic were, you know, colleagues of mine, friends of mine that are reaching out people that are helping me alongside in the workplace, seeing these patients. So I think that was one of the great things Damon provided were not only the lifelong friends, but, you know, a multitude of connections uh, during this pandemic. Yeah, connections seem to be, right, it's the guts, it's the glue, <laughs> those connections. Nick, you had something you wanted to add? Yeah, I, I'd piggyback exactly what, what Eric kind of said there. Um, you know, you kind of had all the, were taught the tools kind of when you were in school at Damon. Um, but not specifically for the exact case we're dealing with now, but at least you felt like you had a basis um, in terms of what you're doing. Shout out to my professors, of course, Dr. Ford out there and other Damon PT professors. Um, but the preceptors, the real life kind of activities, the practice we had uh, within school and then during our clinicals, um, being able to kind of address patients, that kind of was the stuff, that real world kind of conversation uh, really kind of was the basis, kind of getting out finally into the real world once you graduated. So I thought that was a massive help. Yeah, absolutely. Eric, I'm curious what your hopes are for future for healthcare communities, kind of given where we are and where we're going. A loaded question in the sense that obviously the easiest response would be, you know, the, the universal healthcare for all, which we've been trying to do for years now. So that, that that's a little out of my scope of practice and above my pay grade, but on, on a smaller Western New York front, uh, I think the biggest thing I would love to see moving forward is just everybody helping everyone else out. Mm -hmm. So obviously in healthcare, like I just said, with connections and colleagues, you want to work amongst each other and help each other out. The patient's interest is the only one that should matter at that point, you know, their best interest at heart. Uh, I think moving forward, though, after COVID and this pandemic, that was exponentially, you know, increased during this where you have telehealth visits and telemedicine visits, and then you have phone calls and the Skype and the Zoom. Then you have people kind of being seen in the office. And then, you know, maybe there's VNA services enacted now and the home health visits and stuff like that. So I think moving forward, I would just love to see that not only communal approach, but everybody really working together to deliver that best possible health care. And we had it pre-COVID, but I think the one thing the pandemic's done is we need to think outside of the box and see how we can deliver health care to people in need and how to best suit their you know, needs at that given point. Thank you so much, Eric. Other, other folks want to share their, their best hopes for the health care communities moving forward. I'd like to say something. Um, I feel like, and I don't know how it is, but I mean, in general, in a lot of, um, this is something that just comes up in general is short staffing. Um, 
that's already a problem in a lot of healthcare organizations nationwide. It's not just here in Buffalo, but you cannot serve your patients and your community if you have healthcare workers taking care of double or triple the amount of patients that they should be. Um, that just opens up the door for mistakes, for malpractice, for wrongful death, for someone getting the wrong medication, for the wrong limb getting amputated, for all kinds of weird things. So um, I know we have a problem here with that. A lot of it ends up coming down to profit, unfortunately, and I understand it's the way, you know, you have to make money. Um, but you also have to, you also have to take care. You, you can't say that you're taking care of a community if you have, you know, 30 patients assigned to one nurse on a floor. Um, so I think that while I love his, um, Nick's point about, or Eric's point, was it? About the universal health care, that is so important. But also if you're going to be providing that kind of health care, and even with the health care we're providing now, you need to have people to provide it. Right. So really so investing, I think, yeah, investing yeah. In, in beefing up. It's so a big thing our union is talking about right now. It's a big point going forward right now is just yeah. the short staffing issues. We see it in our lab department. We see it at our hospitals. And it's not just in the Kaleida system. It's in all the systems. I think yeah. there's lots of them nationwide outside of Western New York as well. Absolutely. Thank you. Carl, you had something you wanted to add. And just real briefly, I would say telehealth for behavioral health. I think telehealth has, has really uh, expanded the reach for you know, behavioral health services. And while I know it's not for everyone, not everyone likes this kind of platform for receiving therapy, uh, it's proven to be effective. It's proven to be something that has reached people like never before. So even post-COVID, I would say that if we were able to still have behavioral health services offered through telehealth, that would just enable us to reach more people. Yeah, holding on to some of the things that we've gained through this experience, that accessibility. I think of a number of students I've actually been able to connect over the last um, semester and even last semester when this really affected all of us um, or started to affect us all, how many folks have been able to connect through telehealth now that wouldn't have otherwise. Um, and I am also, my one of my hopes is that we'll keep hold of the need to focus on the mental health and well-being of essential workers in healthcare. It's been so highlighted during this time and not that it didn't exist before COVID, it's finally getting some of the needed attention. And I hope that that also is sustained as we move forward because it's not just as a real pandemic that folks might be struggling. Um, recognizing the humanness in each other is always a good thing. Tiffany, do you have any last thoughts as we come to a close here soon? Any takeaways? Um, yeah, I think the recurring statements from everyone, you know, is that healthcare is forever changing. There's always going to be new policies, new procedures. You know, we never, I'm sure none of us thought that we would be in a pandemic, let alone a pandemic of this magnitude. Um, so as healthcare workers, it's very important to be flexible, to be able to roll with the punches, um, that every different, every day brings you something different and you don't know you know, what's going to take place. Um, I can speak for myself. And also, I think for everyone on the panel that, you know, we're proud to be in the roles that we're in. And we're happy to be able to give back to our communities in general, but especially during such a crucial time. Mm, thank you. Any last thoughts or things you wish folks would take away with them from this conversation and this experience? I guess my last thought is just like I had said earlier, just remember that we're all human, both in healthcare and not. Uh, just check on your neighbors, your friends, your family, whether it's, you know, leaving them a note or a little gift on their front step, sending them a text, a phone call, a quick FaceTime. It definitely means a lot to us. And I think it'll be, you know, very great for the well-being of everybody else. So just make sure that no one gets forgotten about, no one gets left behind. You know, we're all in this together. Thanks for that, Eric. And I would say, first and foremost, be kind to each other. We're all going through a lot and we all get uh, our, our nerves frayed and we all are under a lot of stress. So we need to recognize that we're always, you know, not all of us are on our best every day. Um, but aside from that, we've been saying seek help. There are certainly plenty of agencies 
private practitioners in the area that can help. Uh, one resource that I like to give for folks that is a one-stop shop to find out where you can get help is the Mental Health Advocates of West New York. I used to work there, I used to be on the board. It's a great organization and they provide information referral for services in our local community, actually all over West New York. So their phone number is 886-1242 and their website is mhawny.org. So you can call there, you can go to the website. If you call, they'll tell you where to go to get help if you need it. They will, they're not tied into any specific agency, so they kind of base it on what your needs are. And, and finally, I would say too, sometimes folks are really in a really hard spot where they are seriously thinking of their own life and thinking of, of, of if they wanna go on. Well, certainly crisis services is an essential uh, resource in our community for those who might need it. It's 24 seven, seven days a week. And their number is 834-3131. Uh, so that's another place too, that if you feel that you're really in a tough spot, I would call them as well. Thank you for those very concrete resources, Carl, much appreciated and, and always relevant. Others have, oh, Nick, want to chime in there? Yeah, I guess for a closing point, all I would like to say is hopefully we could draw positives from kind of what we're going through here um, to try to help shape kind of the future of healthcare as we go. I know we've touched on that kind of before in here, uh, but kind of learning what works and what doesn't work and hopefully applying it to make life better for the next time around, if there is a next time around, hopefully not going through this pandemic. Um, and I guess for more to kind of recognize that we're not perfect going through the process here, um, that we're obviously making mistakes along the way, but hopefully that we can improve as we go, uh, just to improve everybody as a whole and to kind of lean on others as we go uh, and that support staff to try to get through. Thank you. Any bits? Me? Oh, go ahead, Elimana. Um, I think that it's important, even though I may have said Tiffany said it much better than I did as far as like, you know, if you, if you're having doubts about healthcare, um, but that's what I was trying to say was, you know, maybe you don't need to be a doctor, but you can do something else that helps people. And I think it's important to remember that healthcare is any, any kind of healthcare is so rewarding. I mean, I think about all the people that I helped, all the fears that I've assuaged over, um, the last several months, the information I've been able to give to people where they are able to leave me feeling a little bit more sure about what's going on with their own health, it's important. And we have to remember that we are in currently a pandemic where we don't really know very much and we're learning. It's ever evolving. What some patients have complained to me, well, last week they said it was this and this week, well, because we don't know, we're still learning. But we have an opportunity now, if you're thinking about going into healthcare, if you know that it's something you want to do, but you're a little bit unsure, remember that it's rewarding. And remember that right now, we are being a part of history. This is something that's going to go down in textbooks about health, you know, next year, <laughs> but years from now as well. Just like we talk about, let's say the HIV epidemic of well, it was a pandemic at one point also from 40 years ago that we're like, oh, no, HIV, no big deal. That's might be what happens now with COVID. So if it seems like something that you're interested in, that's also, I think, something to think about. Do you want to be involved in something that if you want to be involved in history, it's, it's a good thing to think about? Yeah. I keep on thinking about some of the students who might be listening, including some of my current and former students. And one of the things I hope that a lot of us take away, myself included, I have to remind myself all the time that life is nothing but a practice. We're learning each time we're going to make mistakes and we're going to learn from each one of them to keep moving forward. And what I keep hearing from all of you in this time we've had together, which I'm so thankful for, is the importance of connecting and for checking in with yourself and those around you regularly, making that a practice, to tune in with yourself, to tune in with others, to see what's needed. We can't make the situation disappear, but we certainly can do an awful lot in pulling together to get through it together, as Eric so nicely said. Um, I wanna thank you all so, so much for your time with us today, panelists. It was such a joy in speaking with you to our audience for chiming in and all the wonderful comments that were coming in. Thanks you. Thanks to Kate and Tom and folks who were doing the wonderful uh, captioning as we went along. Um, 
thanks again to our sponsors, the graduate programs of Damon College. If you want to learn more, you can certainly visit the website, www.damon.edu, and certainly stay connected, see what's coming next, because this is, again, an ongoing uh, series, lots of virtual events, um, things coming soon. So pay attention to social media and any platform you're on. And thanks again so much for joining us. Take care, everybody. Be well. At Damon College, we understand your college journey may be different this year, and we make it easy. With no SAT or ACT required, four 